Councillor, you're live. Great, thank you. Welcome everybody. My name's Councillor Liz Clements. I'm a councillor for Bournville and Cotteridge and I'm joined this evening by my colleague um, Councillor Fred Grindrod, um, also councillor for Bournville and Cotteridge. I'd like to welcome everybody um, to this um, March meeting of the Bournville and Cotteridge um, online ward, ward forum, um, which is live via Microsoft Teams. And we've got a range of um, interesting topics this evening. We're being joined by Dr Justin Varney to talk about um, the current situation with COVID. Um, Simon Delhunty Forrest will be talking about the um, new vision plan for the city centre and then um, Ugan will be talking about um, skills and um, re regeneration and jobs um, after the, pande after the pandemic. Um, so just um, in my first duty as chair is to advise you all that uh, um, that this meeting is being recorded and will be available for people to watch online. So there will be a record of the meeting. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, Justin Varney um, to give us an update on, on COVID-19. Justin. Great, thank you very much, Councillor. Can I just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, it's good for me. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'm working on a split screen, colleagues, so when you get a fabulous side view of my beard, that's because I'm looking up to see the questions that you're asking. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are uh, in terms of the overall picture of COVID in the city. Then I'm going to focus uh, a little bit on where we are with vaccination. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, finish off by talking specifically about the ward picture, both for cases and also uh, for your vaccination update at the moment. So the most recent uh, accurate data we've got is up to the 5th of March. And in the seven days up to that, we were seeing about 87 cases per 100,000. Um, and that compares to about 131 cases per 100,000 in the week before. So you can see quite an impressive drop. Um, and we're really starting to see the impact of vaccination, but also all the restrictions we've been living under are really working in terms of bringing down case rates. Um, and that's really important, particularly as we're seeing across the world, new variants appear, um, which are more infectious, potentially more dangerous, or create problems for the vaccine. Um, and while we're still in this phase of ramping up vaccination, we've got to do everything we can to keep case rates low. Um, overall, we're ranked 36th highest in England when it comes to case rates, uh, where number one is the highest and 150 is the lowest. So we're still in the top kind of third of the country uh, in terms of our overall picture. And some of that reflects that we were certainly seeing high levels of the Kent variant uh, of the virus spreading across the West Midlands and across Birmingham just before we went into lockdown. Um, and we know that in areas that did have high levels of the Kent variant, it does take a lot longer to bring those numbers down. So we think that's probably sitting behind uh, what's going on and why it is taking us slightly longer than, than some of the areas in the south to come down. Of course, they were in restrictions for longer than us, so that also is playing out. Most of the spread we're seeing at the moment is through households, um, through social interaction where people unfortunately have broken the rules and had people over to visit uh, when they shouldn't, and through workplaces. And we continue to see quite a lot of workplace clusters uh, of cases. And it's really good now that any business can access workplace testing. And we're really encouraging businesses to take up that offer from the Department of Health so that they can test their staff twice a week and help identify the people who may be infectious but may not know it because they haven't got any symptoms. Our hospital admissions are coming down. Um, and over the last week, we've seen daily admission rates to university hospital vary between 20 and 40 cases a day. And that's a massive difference from where we were uh, just three weeks ago, where we were varying between 50 cases and 80 cases a day. So really seeing some benefits from that first wave of vaccination uh, playing through in terms of the pressure on the NHS. That being said, it's still quite pressured in the NHS because 
as we've got better at treating COVID, people are living longer, so they're not dying quickly, but they are staying in hospital longer. And so actually the pressure in our intensive care beds and in the hospital beds is still very high, but the pressure coming in the front door is starting to slow down. So I think we've still got probably another month or so at least where the NHS will be under a lot of pressure because of the COVID inpatient load. So just moving on to the vaccination picture at the moment, we're now rolling out vaccine uh, to I think it's group seven. So people over the age of 55 can get the vaccine. Uh, people who are clinically extremely vulnerable can book an appointment for the vaccine and people who are also clinically vulnerable. And that's the group of people generally who in a normal year would be offered the flu jab. They can also book an appointment to get their flu jab, uh, sorry, to get their COVID jab. And if you go onto the NHS website, you can book directly through the NHS uh, vaccination portal there. Um, where we have housebound patients, the NHS has a housebound service and that's been working through uh, and I think has vaccinated over three and a half thousand uh, housebound patients in Birmingham. Um, and those are the people that are on the GP list as being housebound. So, um, they are people that the GPs would normally know they have to do a home visit for. Um, so that's been rolling out over the last couple of weeks and very good uptake there as well. And generally what I'm seeing is week on week, uptake of the COVID vaccine is improving across the city, which is really good because ultimately that is the thing that we need to get really high coverage of in order for the roadmap to progress and for us to see a more flexible and relaxed summer. So moving on to the situation in uh, Bourneville and Cottage Ward, um, up to the 8th of March, so in the seven days between the 2nd and the 8th of March, uh, the uh, rate in the ward was 0.5 cases per thousand population, and that compares overall to Birmingham of 0.85 per thousand population. The ward ranked 54th out of 69 wards, where first is the highest case rate and 69th is the lowest. So definitely towards the, the lower end, which is brilliant. Um, there were nine cases reported uh, during that period in the ward. Uh, so again, at the lower end, which is, is really good as well. Um, and you've got 21 COVID champions in, in the ward, which I'd say is one of the highest in the city. So really great to have so many uh, local community members helping us get messages out. Um, obviously, these are small numbers. So when we look at the demographics of cases in the ward, we look over a month period. So looking at the month between the 7th of February and the 8th of March, about a third of your new cases were in 20 to 39 year olds uh, and 25% uh, were between 0 to 19 and 27% between 40 and 59. So it's an interesting pattern and I would say slightly younger than the average um, that for Birmingham as a whole, particularly in that 0 to 19. So slightly more children uh, and uh, young adults uh, testing positive. Um, and I think that probably reflects some of your student population um, as well as some of the school uh, that you have in the patch. Um, when we look at ethnicity, about 67% of your new cases are in the white community and about 13% in your Asian community. And I think that's pretty reflective of the ward demographic. Um, and and a higher proportion than the Birmingham average uh, in terms of uh, cases in the white community, but as I said, I think it uh, does reflect very much your local community. Um, there are no major outbreaks in the ward, so there aren't any great clusters of cases. And what we're seeing is the majority are um, households with uh, small numbers of uh, members of the house all testing positive, um, some connection to workplaces uh, and some connection uh, coming through, particularly to nurseries at the moment. Uh, we're seeing a few clusters around those across the city. Um, so finally, just touching on uh, vaccine uptake um, and we last looked, pulled the vaccine data on the 9th of March um, and I'm just flipping through it to uh, find uh, your ward. So bear with me one second and here we go. Um, so uptake in Bourneville and Cottage, really good in the over 80s, um, so 92.4%. Uh, which is one of the higher uh, uptakes in, in the city. 
75 to 79, 94.4%, 70 to 74, 94% as well. So doing really well in terms of uh, those who are older taking up the vaccine uh, quickly for the first dose, which is really good. Um, where I think it's it still could be improved is particularly um, in the people who are clinically extremely vulnerable, those that have been shielding, it's tracking about 85%. Still pretty good compared to a lot of the city, but we really want to see that over 90%. And in the new um, clinically vulnerable group, um, that group that's been eligible now for a week or two, that's tracking only at about 70%. So I think for the ward in terms of vaccination, what I'd really encourage you to, to um, do is really uh, encourage people who have got health conditions to check on the website, check if they're eligible, and if they are, really encourage them to get a jab um, because I think you particularly if we did see a third wave as they're seeing in southern Europe at the moment um, those are the groups of people that I would be most worried about not being protected and um, now we have more vaccine available more uh, vaccination slots uh, becoming available across the city really is a good time to get your vaccine so I'll leave it there councillor I'm happy to take any questions that anyone from the foreign house for me Thanks very much, Justine. It was really excellent to have that detailed update and get get the you know the the, the statistics um, um, for our, for our ward and what you said about the um, vaccine up, uptake amongst the clinically um, extremely vulnerable. Obviously, have an important message for all of us to take away and encourage anyone in our families or our friendship groups you know, to to take up that opportunity and, and check out their their eligibility. Um, given what you said about the 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 incidents in in the younger age groups, the 0 to 19 and the, the 20 to 39 year olds. Can you do, uh, do you have any observations about how how the, um, the council and public health are, um, are helping schools, are supporting schools um, which are now reopened, and wh whether you have any um, concerns about how that's going, or, or or any just general views about how how the return to school has gone? Yeah, so I, I'd say at the moment my view is the return to school is going better here than in many other areas, actually. Um, I think some of that is actually a lot of schools have been open throughout the whole pandemic because we have unfortunately a lot of vulnerable children um, and we also have a lot of children who work who, whose parents work for the NHS or social care so have fitted that essential worker a lot of schools have been open and they've been testing uh, for quite a while now um, so, you know, I think we've been in a good position. Um, we meet regularly with the head teachers. I met earlier this week with all the head teachers from across the city to, to do a Q&A session with them. Um, and I have to say they're all pretty comfortable and confident about testing. Um, I think uh, where we're seeing, um, where I think there are opportunities is really going to be the question mark around the families of primary school children. So secondary school children test three times at school and then they get access to home testing kits, um, which they take home from school. And I think that that model working quite well. Um, we've been doing some fantastic work with our new Youth Champions programme um, and I've just seen the rough cuts of the videos they've been doing in different languages, which puts me to shame because I can only really speak English and um, showing how to take a test. So it's like 15 year olds doing it to show other 15 year olds. And I think that's just brilliant. Um, where I think the risk space is actually primary school children. So the model for primary school children is rather than us testing primary school kids the whole time uh, and using the swab because it's not it's not nice for any of us but you know for a six-year-old it's really not nice the model instead is to ask their families and their childcare bubbles to test twice a week and that really relies on parents stepping up and um, taking those tests uh, and i think that's probably the bit i'm most worried about is whether parents will um, take up the tests um, because if they don't there is a risk we will see case rates rise again as we did just before Christmas uh, before the end of the winter term um, because we do know the Kent variant is more infectious uh, and does spread more and that's why we had to close schools to try and control it so I think the big ask is really to encourage any parents anyone who's in a childcare bubble so if you look on after your grandkids one day a week for example you should be testing 
every three to four days with a lateral flow kit. You can order them online if you're a parent or in a childcare bubble through the Department of Health website. You can also pick them up from uh, some of the testing sites. But if you go through the online website, it tells you where you can get a kit closest to you. Um, and the council are standing up more collection sites for home testing kits for parents. Um, and we should get those through from the department middle of next week. So that will also improve. But the key thing is, Basically, all of us need to be testing more. And if you're out for any reason, leaving your home for work or for school, please get a lateral flow test every three to four days and help play your part in keeping this under control. Thanks very much, Justin. Again, very comprehensive and, and, and helpful reply there. And I think because we've got, no, um, I think it's four secondary schools and um, three or four um, primary schools in our in our ward. So it's a really you know, really important um, um, message you know, for for our, for our for our residents. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Although I would um, actually you know Councillor Councillor Greenwood has just come in. So Fred, over to you. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, Justin, for an excellent presentation. Um, I just want to get so, so the two clear messages are if you're uh, in a in a vulnerable and shielding group, or basically if, if you normally get a flu uh, vaccination, you can go and register and get 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 your your, your COVID vaccination now. I'm, I'm just trying to kind of summarise what, what you've got there. So that's a key message. And the other message is because getting primary school parents um, to, to 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 get into this habit of lateral flow testing, and I think that's actually quite a new challenge, isn't it, for the community? We've got a lot of primary schools in, in our area, so it'll be interesting to hear from residents how that's going, how they feel supported in doing that, because I think that 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 that, that, that that's quite a challenge as someone who has uh, primary school kids myself. Um, so it it would be good, I guess, to get um you know get parents' views on how that's going. If parents feel that that's becoming a real challenge for them is there places that they can get further support and advice particularly if perhaps they're not um I, 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 as able to contact the school as they might feel confident to be yeah so i i think first of all on the vaccination um the reason i say it, check the website is that it's not an exact match to the flu jab population um, so if you are entitled to the flu jab every year, go on the NHS website and just check. Um, there are also some additional groups there as well for people that don't normally get the flu jab, particularly people who are carrying a lot of excess weight. So people who have a body mass index of over 40, for example, should be getting the, the COVID jab and they wouldn't normally necessarily have the flu jab. So do check the website if you've got a specific condition because um, it will give you the, the correct answer. Um, in terms of the testing, I mean, my advice on this is um, if you're not used to testing, um, then rather than starting with the home testing kit, go to one of our lateral flow testing sites. Um, we have at the moment, I think we're now up to seven uh, across the city. Um, they're open seven days a week from eight in the morning till six in the evening. It's free. You just turn up. You don't need an appointment. I haven't yet met anyone who's had to wait more than 20 minutes to get their test done. They're very, very efficient. Um, and it will give you the experience of doing the swab um, and you'll be able to see what happens with the test. And it just gives you that extra little bit of confidence before you order a kit to use at home. Um, I know lots of people did it last weekend. I can see in the numbers um, before school restarted for many children, many families went off and did it as a kind of weekend trip. Um, so the whole family could get tested and they all kind of get that experience of doing a, a testing site. Um, there's lots of information on the council website. We also have 89 pharmacies where you can book an appointment if you'd rather not chance it and you want a definite slot. And there are also three mobile units as well um, that we move around the city each week to try and increase access. Um, so do you have a look on the council website and you'll be able to find all the, um, all the testing sites. Um, and I'm not sure, um, just asking Karen a technical question. If I'm able to screen share, Karen, have I got permission to be able to do that? Um, yes, I think so. Yes, right, I let's... think you do as a presenter. Great. So maybe if I, I'll just show you on the um, on the website um, what your uh, what you'll be seeing. So hopefully you go onto the council website, um, and what I normally do is just uh, click straight on the uh, the COVID page.
this is always a risk doing this live in a ward forum because it can always go wrong. Um, it's working so far, so don't. <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> don't jinx it. You're looking at this block, which says lateral flow testing device, and you click on that. And this tells you all about what is the test um, and what the how to read the test. And what we've also included where the main site we have is in the Hippodrome in the town centre, but we've also got other testing sites. And if you go to section three, it lists where the main council run sites, which we have across the city. Um, and then we've also got the mobile testing sites and it tells you where they are when they're open each day of the week. They're open slightly later in the evening, but you have to book an appointment for these sites. Um, and then we've also got now pharmacies and there are 89 pharmacies and you click on that and it takes you through to the full list. But the other thing, and this is where I, I'm afraid councillors, I am gambling a little bit because it um, we had a glitch on this this morning, but hopefully it'll work. We've now got a new map. Um, and if this comes up on the screen, brilliant. So what you can do on the map is you can zoom in um, to the part of the city you want to look at and it will show you exactly what's there. So if we go down, hopefully you can see uh, Bourneville is uh, here, which I think is uh, your part of the world. Um, just trying to zoom in a bit. Uh, and you can see that you've got two pharmacies that are testing sites uh, in Cotteridge. Um, and they're probably your closest sites. Um, there's also a Oddingley Hall, which is just down the road in Northfield as well, uh, where you can have a test. Um, and if you click on the um, icon, it tells you the name of the pharmacy and it also gives you a link to book the appointment. So that's a new thing. We only added that this week. I'm really glad to, I could show you that and it worked um, because we're quite pleased about this because it does allow you and you can also do it by popping your postcode in and it will zoom in on the map for you. But you can also see what else is available around the city um, where you can get a test and whether it's a walk in site um, or you need to book an appointment. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and as I say, we are putting more information up there as it becomes available as well. Great, thanks very much, um, Justin. I think the interactive map looks um, well, um, looks very impressive. And yes, it was seemed to be working really well in your demonstration. So I think that will make it easier for people. And as you said, sort of going and having it, having the test administered at one of the, at the sites is a way to build confidence at, um, as, you, as, as, the, as people are, um, supporting their children back back into school so yeah really really helpful advice there i'm just looking at the um our question and answer function on the on this teams package i can't see more questions at the moment in i think that's probably because you gave such a comprehensive pre um, presentation justin that all and it's so detailed and so localized to bourne and cottage that um um it's a uh, answered everyone's questions that they had in, in the back of their head. So um, I'm going to say um, thank you very much for joining us this evening and you know, um, thank you for all the work that you and your team are doing and you know, for your um, willingness to come to all of these ward forums and, and keep us all informed. So thank you very much and um, you know, see you or one of your team maybe the next time, but thanks very much. Thanks Justin. So the next item on our agenda is a is a presentation from um, Simon Delahunty Forrest. He's going to be talking to us about the, the City Council's um, new vision um, for the for the city centre. Um, and I think this will be you know, of interest to all of us. And uh, it's, it's a really a vision that's driven by um, greening um, the city centre and, and making it a more um, inviting environment for all of us um, when we go into the city centre. So over to you, um, Simon. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, can I just check that you can hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Hope, uh, hope brilliant. So. Well, Same for everybody else. You, thank you very much for the invite uh, to come and speak um, to you this evening about uh, our future city plan. Um, it's uh, it's not a prescriptive plan as it stands at the moment. It's a plan for the next 20 years. But the idea was that when it was launched a month ago, just over a month ago by the leader, it was about the initiative about shaping our city together. You know, the, the, the idea around the planet at this moment in time is to gauge opinion, what people think, how they see the uh, future of the city going forward uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, and, and what it's about is that we're not going to lock ourselves away in a room 
for 12 to 18 months and come out with a plan and say, there you go, everybody get on with it. Uh, what we want is a plan that is driven by our communities. You know, what do they want to see from the city centre in, in the next 20 years? So I, I, I'll turn my camera off now and share with you the presentation uh, going forward. Just move that up, just bear with me. OK, I presume you can all see that. Yeah, that's good. Brilliant. Excellent. OK, our future city plan and our future city plan is what we're going to brand, brand everything going on in, in, in the future. I think it's just probably a bit important just to tell you who I am. I, I'm Simon Delonte Forrest, uh, as the councillor said, uh, I'm the acting assistant director for development within planning and, and development within Birmingham City Council. Uh, I'm an architect, uh, I'm not a planner, uh, and I have responsibility for about 16 or so different heads of service in developing and uh, providing a service for the good uh, citizens of Birmingham and going forward. So one of my remits when I uh, first took this role on uh, over 18 months ago was about that future development of the city centre going forward. Now, our, our history, Birmingham's history is one of innovation and leadership, you know, but Birmingham is a city proud of its past, but is even more excited about its future. And everyone knows Birmingham is the heart of the Industrial Revolution, becoming the world's first manufacturing city, thanks to the work of James Watt, Matthew Bolton and William Murdoch. You know, we built our reputation as the city of a thousand trades, but our city wasn't just founded to make things. At our heart is a spirit which is both imaginative and practical, fueling industry and culture. And it's this spirit which has brought a stream of firsts to the world. The first working steam engine, the first ever hole in the heart surgery, the world's first heavy metal band, all made in Birmingham. And I'll come back to the heavy metal band later on. And our need to innovate is part of our DNA. You know, Birmingham's sense of moving forward isn't just part of our motto on our crest of, uh, of, of, crest, uh, of arms. You know, it's our history, it's part of our DNA. It's about going forward and Birmingham has always gone forward. It's led by example. And on that crest is both the engineer and the artist, which symbolises what Birmingham's about, about that craft, that innovation, and about that forward looking into the future. And over the last 30 years, you know, we've worked in partnership with developers, investors and in our community to transform the city centre with world class facilities like the ICC, Birmingham Arena and Symphony Hall. And we've created iconic architecture, you know, in the new, you know, for example, the Boring and Birmingham City Library. And we've brought our heritage with us, integrating the canal network into the heart of the city and incorporating more modern additions like the Rotunda, create a cityscape that feels connected and is familiar to our residents. And we've been the driving force behind new developments like Bringley Place, Paradise, Arena Central, Snow Hill. And we are now gearing up to create that whole new city quarter on the doorstep of high speed too. And Birmingham is a city of energy and opportunity. So the Birmingham you see today is one that has revolution and progress running through its veins. It's what we do, it's our DNA, and that's what puts us ahead of all the other cities within the, the UK. And we are a city with energy, the most useful city in the whole of Europe, with 40% of our population under the age of 25. One of the most cultural, diverse and integrated communities in the UK, creating a rich tapestry of flavours, sights and sounds which enhance the experience of life in the city where community theatre and world-class performers coexist seamlessly. All this gives us the opportunity and the imperative to expand our thinking, to look beyond the city centre and to embrace the surrounding communities where so many of our residents live and work. So we have a strong outward blueprint for our future. Now is the time for us to look forward to the next chapter in our story, a chapter that isn't going to be without its challenges. You know, no one can fail to notice 
the impact of COVID-19. You know, we just had Justin on telling us where we are, you know, in the current position today and the impact it continues to have on all of us. And the climate emergency hasn't gone away either. And our ambition to be a carbon neutral city, which is set out in our route to zero plan, will need to be tackled with imagination and practical solutions. And technology continues to change the way we live, work and travel. And, you know, and that's obviously apparent by what we're doing this evening, sitting in this virtual meeting and talking to each other and reaching out to each other. But most of all, we need to create a city that puts our people first. If our history shows us anything, it's that people of Birmingham are the best equipped to tackle these challenges head on and to articulate a successful future. What's needed is an ambitious blueprint for the future, a blueprint we've set out in our future city plan. Now, some of you might be aware of the big city plan that was came out in 2010 and it did exactly what it said on the tin. It was the, a growth strategy, an economic strategy for the city centre for the next 10 years. And it did that. You know, it had the five areas of transformation uh, on there, you know, from high speed to to Grand Central to Paradise. It did that. This master plan is different. It's more radical and it's more ambition. It's about breaking down them barriers. It's not an inward looking master plan, it's outward looking. It's about expansion of that city core to reach out to them areas that need to benefit by what I call spreading the jam, spreading the opportunity that city centre provides that we can all benefit from. So the plan is broad, it's ambitious and it's comprehensive and setting out our future plan is more than just buildings, roads and infrastructure. It's about the type of city that we want to create, the lives we want to help people lead, the neighbourhoods we want residents to create, and most of all, the type of city we want to be. Our communities need to feel like equal partners with us, able to share in the benefits of growth that creates he happy, healthy communities built around resilient environments. What we've got to do is build more houses a lot quicker that are fit for purpose, that addresses the fuel poverty, uh, poverty issues that the city ex is experiencing in certain areas. We have to provide better public transport and access to that public transport, you know, that enables people get to get to work, you know, and by that providing better uh, access to good jobs. It's about repositioning that green position as well in terms of health and well-being. So it's a plan driven by clear principles and we, we've got to have principles to guide the development of our plan and, we, and we've established four principles that everything we do must align to and that's really important. Firstly, any new development must be green and this is about more than just planting trees, it's about creating cities which enable people to easily live their lives in a way that has minimal negative impact on our planet. The city we create must be equitable with opportunities open to all when no one gets left behind. Where you live must never be a barrier to achieving your potential. But we want to create places which are not just pleasant to look at or highly functional, but communities which are genuinely livable. This means people focused design where citizens can create homes and communities, not just a place to live. And we must be distinctive, allowing the pride of our individual communities to shine through and enhance the spaces they inhabit. And the ambition then will be delivered by six key themes. Growth for all, a city of nature, a city of centres, a city of connections, a city of heritage and innovation and a city of layers. So in terms of the city of growth for all, is growth in our local economy, economy must be green. It's got to be sustainable and for the benefit of all. Physically growing the reach of the city centre beyond the ring road and out to communities beyond is going to result in major new developments. Rapidly growing the numbers of good quality homes that we provide for residents and leading the way in green, affordable, sustainable housing. And the communities in these areas need to feel the benefit of this investment through those better homes, better leisure, cultural facilities and access to high quality employment. Their engagement or your engagement will be key to activating the benefits that this plan will bring. So as I said earlier, you know, it's not that inward looking approach. It's that outward looking approach. Yes, we've got to address 
issues that are in the city centre and other opportunities, you know, particularly with what COVID has presented, you know, the future of retail, etc., the future of office. But we want to reach out beyond that that ring road. You know, we want to spread that that jam, as I said. And the way to look at it is that the city centre, and I've always called the city centre as the town. You probably can tell by my accent. I'm born and bred Brummie, lived here all my life. Um, and always refer to the city centre as the town. And around that town, we have a series of villages. It's about how we reach out and connect to them villages. And then how do we connect out further and wider with that ambition? The, a city of nature. You know, we know more than ever the vital role that access to open public space plays in people's sense of well-being. Our plan presents exciting new opportunities to radically build on the existing green capital within the city. You know, we, we, when you look at the city from a bird's eye view, the green and blue capital is immense. We don't have to reinvent it. We've got it. It's already there. It just needs repositioning and repurposing. You know, we might need to add to it, uh, but it's there. You know, and we all know from bad planning in the 60s how green space became, you know, unpleasant, became dangerous. You know, these are the things that we have to address because we've all learned from through COVID the importance of health and well-being and that access to that green amenity. And our own network, which you know is so often seen as a barrier, will become our greatest strength in joining a new lease of life as city greenways. You know, areas like the, the Ring Road and the Hockley flyover have the potential to become a network of green corridors, making active travel an attractive alternative and bringing people into the city in a, a sustainable uh, way. And I'll show you what we mean by that in a minute. But we've got to build back better. And all our new buildings will have to incorporate new green infrastructure in creating a positive legacy from the built environment. The green agenda can't be tokenistic. It's got to be embedded in everything we do. And that's not just the spaces and places between buildings and our local centres, you know, and our schools, you know, and our cultural facilities. It's got to be in the buildings we build for our community. You know, if we have to build that green infrastructure going forward, you know, and building that amenity within them buildings as well. Because no, not everybody has got access to a, a garden, but those people that live in apartment blocks, you know, need that provision that's integrated within them facilities. And what we're not saying is that, you know, we cover every building in, you know, um, a, a green technology in terms of different trees and planting. But, you know, we, we have to do things differently. We have to build back better. And Birmingham always leads by example. And this is what we need to do with this plan. To, City of centres and a city that recognises we have multiple centres. You know, when I talked about them villages going forward, you know, over the years we have built a world class city centre, but this has often meant that communities living in its shadow have felt disconnected. Now is the time to support these communities to develop identities as equal in their own right. And, you know, you know this from experience. I know it from experience from living at the Maypole. You know, what is the, you know, that relevance of the city centre to me? And it has got a lot of relevance for us all. We will support these neighbourhoods to become vibrant in connected areas in sync with the city, uh, with the centre of the city, but retaining their sense of place. We will foster inter-community collaboration, building resilience for the future for investments in homes, employment, education, transport and leisure all delivered to the highest standards. The city of connections, you know, we all know for too long, many of our transport corridors have served as barriers to, ra to rather than facilitators of movement. Our Birmingham Transport Plan 2031 set out our, uh, set out our ambition for a people focused movement strategy, which relocates road space to active travel, giving us a sustainable infrastructure that delivers our zero carbon goals. We've got to address the climate crisis agenda. You know, we have to start developing carbon, carbon neutral developments, you know, and in terms of traffic, we're already doing that with the CAS and that will be widened out going forward uh, on, on that. You know, and it's really interesting, the case study in, in America, a place called Lancaster, they invested $11.5 million in, into turning over part of the um, uh, 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 highway to green infrastructure, you know, giving it over to green landscaping. 
it's now got a return of 230 million dollars back into the economy it's transformed transformed the whole of the area it's created that ambition it's created that confidence it's it's attracted that investors as well coming to uh, coming to that part of uh, america and that's what we need to do we've got to invest to really reap them gains going forward and this need for connection extends to digital technology that allows our residents to connect with each other with employment opportunities and with with the world beyond our city you know and as i said we're doing it right now you know and our children you know it's second hand to them now and we need to embed technology into everything we do and the places and the buildings we create a city that builds on our heritage of knowledge and innovation and that's not that's both socially and physically we must continue to invest in education and learning for our communities providing everyone with the opportunity to learn new skills and share each other's knowledge to create a unique and highly skilled workforce now more than 70,000 students have ch chosen Birmingham as the place to study you know that's absolutely amazing when you think about it providing us with a rich pool of talent that we need to help us to tackle the challenging challenge of living in a more sustainable way through the use of science data and technology and our city soul will continue to be nurtured by a thriving and diverse creative media and art scene you know we, we need to keep our young people in our city we need to provide the opportunity for our young people to grow to learn you know to be nurtured because they're the future going forward and, and, and we have to do that you know and we have to bring out them areas where you know there are there is poverty we've got to bring people out of poverty and provide the opportunity going forward a dive you know a city of layers the, the, the diverse city of layers this is a bit of a um, you know uh, i keep on banging the drum on this one you know we have you know we've been gifted a diverse city by our communities past and present through the landmarks they've built, the traditions they've established and the cultural capital they've created, expressed through belief, through art and through music. You know, this diversity supports thousands of jobs across our city today, but has the potential to make Birmingham a destination city for the people and businesses who value a rich cultural experience. The future city we create must enable the continued expression of this diversity to offer showcase to visitors of us at our best but to also enhance the lives of all those who call Birmingham home, you know, and this hobby horse for me is really, really important. You know, it's about the past. It's about the present. It's about the future. You know, you've got Liverpool bangs on about the Beatles. Well, the Beatles scene was going on in Birmingham well before it was happening in Liverpool. You know, you've got Manchester banging on about, you know, Oasis and the Hacienda and Manchester City Football Club, you know, and Man United well we, we, we've got two teams in the Premier League you know we've got Aston Villa we've got Wolverhampton we need to get Blues in there we, and, and West Brom are in there as well and we have that musical heritage in our city you know from the Moody Blues to Wizard to Steel Pulse to UB40 to Duran Duran you know uh, and, and to the mighty Black Sabbath you know and you know whatever you think of heavy metal you know Black Sabbath changed the world in terms of heavy metal and I went to the, the exhibition the home of metal which I really would highly recommend for you to go and see when, when it comes back to the city when we can all go back uh, to uh, exhibitions and, and museums and what was really compelling for me was the story in two pieces the first bit of the story about where they grew up in Birmingham you know the challenges they had in terms of uh, you know getting a home the the challenges of getting employment the challenges of you know petty crime and going to prison you know and you know it's really really compelling and that landscape that they lived in and the, and the real important bit was the end you know at the end of the exhibition there's, there's a map that asks all those that visited the exhibition to put a, a pin in the map of where they've come from and people from all over the world came to Birmingham to pay homage to the band you know people from syria from korea from the states to australia it's incredible and we need to capitalize on that capital you know and we've got so much going on in our cultural uh, diverse uh, communities that we need to celebrate that richness of color and opportunity and we need to provide that platform for people to do that going forward because it's easy for me to draw lines on a plan and write narratives about how a city should look but it's what 
people need to be telling me how the city needs to look and how it needs to evolve and develop going forward. And it's a real opportunity to do that. You know, I've, I go to you know all different parts of the city and recently before COVID we went to London and, and the audience were asking me about could I introduce them to the Peaky Blinders? You know, the power of that programme, you know, and I had to explain to them, you know, it's a TV programme, the Peaky Blinders no longer exist, but they didn't believe me, you know, it really resonated that power. You know, Tolkien was from Birmingham, you know, and Tolkien's bigger than Harry Potter. We need to bring these elements to how we create our city going forward because it is our DNA, as I said right at the start. I've nearly finished now, you'll be glad to know. So when, when, we, when the Leisure launched this initiative, Shaping Our City Together, there's a few questions, you know, and, and there's what these CGI show here. And this is not prescriptive by any stretch of the imagination. But he was asking, could roads like the Suffolk Street Queensway be remodelled to provide a ring of green spaces? As I said earlier, handing over that ring road from, you know, to, from vehicles to green infrastructure with good quality uh, public transport. And it's been done, as I said, in America. And we need to set that bar high to do that, that opportunity. And how can we reduce the dominance of tra traffic dominated harsh environments to support improvements to public transport and encourage safer, safer cycling and walking routes? And so that's a question we've asked. Is it the right thing to do? We think it is, but we want to know what you think going forward. Um, and how can we rethink the retail core area to support and encourage a wider range of businesses around a new green space at the heart of the city? Well before COVID, you know, retail was dying on its feet. You know, it's got to be repositioned. You know, people will still want to shop. They will still want to have that uh, experience of touching things and, it, and trying things on and wh whatever. But it won't be like what we used to have. It. There won't be them big floor plates. So we need to provide an environment that will get people and families in the city centre that, you know, will go shopping, but will experience family leisure opportunities. And our idea here is to put a park right in the heart of the city centre with mixed use development, with residential, with retail, with office. You've got high speed two to your right on your doorstep, Park Birmingham in the middle and Cathedral Park to the left. And we're just asking the question, you know, and the feedback we've had back is that this isn't big enough. It needs to be a bigger park, you know, and this is where we can celebrate our cultural diversity and the, and the great pioneers of Birmingham. You know, and this could become that, you know, how we celebrate that heritage going forward. And then how do we expand on Digbeth's creative vitality and enhance our cultural diversity with a major visitor destination? You know, maybe a new museum and film studio complex. You know, how could, could new green spaces be created to connect the Dutters and Viaduct Sky Park? You know, the canals and the river Ray to Garrison Park uh, on that. And how can we include new homes and workspace? And you can see here at the foot of the, um, uh, the, the uh, diagram, you know, that idea of the uh, the Sky Park, the old of the Sun Viaduct, which is redundant, turn that into a, 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 a vertical park. You know, the New York High Line have got one and it's there, you know, and we're working to deliver that. That will connect Highgate through that city centre core, through Digbeth to this new cultural quarter. And it's where Birmingham grew up. We're talking about putting a film studio there that's then complemented by potentially the new Birmingham Science and Industry Museum that's then supported by incubator units, starter up units, you know, where we keep our young people to develop, you know, tech, uh, pre-production, post-production and where people can live as well going forward. And we're just asking that question. And then, you know, finally about you know, how can we rethink buildings around the forthcoming high speed to Curzon station to provide new workspaces and new homes? Now, how can we transform green spaces connections through that knowledge quarter to improve access to Aston and BC universities? Millennium Point, what goes on in that building is fantastic. The building's not fit for purpose. It blocks them connections. And our ambition here is to restart that, that blueprint, you know, take that building down, create that place them connections and that opportunity and grow that offer you know grow the opportunity for jobs and, ex and education and it's on the doorstep of high speed too and what's exciting about this is that Birmingham City Council own land in this so we can drive this uh, sort of initiative forward by using our assets to create this opportunity and by doing that and generating that capital we can spread the opportunity to other parts of our city Today, you know, it was launched on the 26th of January. We had a massive uptake 
people that signed in for it. It broke all records on the morning of 4,000 hits. And by the end of the week, it was 8,000. Uh, 8, We've ha held a whole load of themed online Q&A events. Uh, we've had a People for Public Services event, which uh, uh, over 100 people had attended, which uh, resulted in a community involvement board, you know, youth uh, services commissioned to do detailed engagement to actually focus, uh, to target focus groups, uh, etc. And one of the things I'm really working on with our, uh, our comms people is that, you know, Be Heard's great, but if we're going to really reach people, we need to use YouTube, we need to use TikTok, etc. We need to use other platforms to really reach out to, to people. And so what's coming up, uh, this is a bit out of date, but there's a whole load of webinars which are on the website. They're on YouTube. You can link uh, on them uh, and, and they're all themed around these things I've talked about today. And the next steps are, and this is the pressure that I've got, <laughs> is one about that ongoing engagement. And that's what we really want. That's the purpose of this evening's meeting is really to listen, listen to what you've got to say. Uh, and the pressure on me is that we want to launch this framework in November at the uh, COP26, which is the climate change agenda in Edinburgh. You know, we really feel that we need to launch this ambition and say, look, Birmingham's leading on this green agenda. It's leading on building more homes for people. It's leading on creating jobs for people, et cetera, and leading to getting people out of poverty. So the big question is, you know, will you join us? You know, we, we really want your input. On this and you can go on the website there is a link to that that you can put your ideas down because we generally want to listen as i said at the start we don't want to lock ourselves away in a room and come out and tell you what to do we want you to tell us what to do so that's me very very quickly i'll stop sharing now and uh, go back to councillor Great. Thanks very much, Simon. I, I certainly found that very inspirational and I, I really heartily endorse that you know, the calls for more green space in the city centre, because I think that you know, that's something that, you know, where we, you know, we can create an environment which is, is, is friendly for, for people and for, for active travel. So you know, that, it's great to see that. Um, just to, in terms of how, how people engage on the website, can you reassure us that it's easy to find the link for, for, for um, giving feedback? Yeah, yeah, you can. What what I'll do, I'll make sure after this meeting, I'll, I'll send Karen the um, the links and she can circulate them. Great, that's fantastic. OK, I've, I've got um, I can see a question from um, Chris Martin, which is in the in the um, the, the, the event Q&A. Um, so Chris is asking um, how will the, the continued up, upgrading of the city centre benefit residents in the most deprived wards such as um, Lozelles or Sparkbrook? And how, how will this be part of the just transition? Um, it, that we uh, need for the, uh, the routes because it's zero carbon and um, in response to the climate emergency. And then another question, which is um, what's going to be the um, impact of the closure of John Lewis and Debenhams in the city centre? Yeah, uh, really, really good questions, you know, and um, and, and, and these were the, the, the questions that really got me thinking about the journey we're now going on the, the this 18 months ago. You know, is about, about because part part what I was doing as part of my role was going out to them hard to reach areas, to the um, the the senior schools. I use the old word senior schools, not high schools, um, and talking to young people about you know opportunities within the built environment. And what I meant by that was about you know the job opportunities for young people. You know, in terms of construction. You know, from being an architect to a planner to be a bricklayer, etc. And what really resonated with me was about when young people were telling me about, well, you know, they didn't feel that the city centre had any relevance for them. You know, they hadn't even gone to the city centre, even their parents hadn't gone to the city centre, even though some of them, you know, were within a 10 minute bus ride to go in there. And that that was really sort of compelling for me being born and bred in Birmingham. And as a young person, I used always used the city centre and I wanted to understand why. And people didn't feel there was that relevant and what it was for them. So. The, the idea of the plan was to reach out to them communities, you know, not be that inward looking master plan. It's that outward looking plan, uh, master plan. And what's radical about this, you know, how we're going to try and make this relevant is, is twofold, really. Is it well more than twofold, threefold is that green infrastructure providing that real meaningful green infrastructure, like I said about that ring road that then reaches out in that network of events of green spaces of the, through them communities. Where can we look at existing green spaces and repurpose them or provide green spaces 
within them communities? Do they need them community, uh, them green spaces within them communities? And also on the back of that is about that then widening that network of the public transport in terms of metro, in terms of speed, you know, where are the gaps? And this plan will show where them gaps are. And what we need is them communities to come back to us and say, this is where the gaps are, this is where it doesn't work, or this is where it does work. You know, it's not just about buildings, it's about the public transport as well. That's fundamental to it, because if we're gonna get people to go in, into the city, they're gonna have to get that access uh, going there. The big change on this is this is where we're radically doing things differently. And, you know, everyone around this virtual table tonight will realise, you know, that, you know, we all watch the telly and see the news, you know, that COVID has caused, you know, financial black holes, you know, for all local authorities across the country, you know, and we've got to address them to, to continue to provide that first class service, you know, to the good people of Birmingham. and. You know, one way of looking at doing that, you know, is about looking at our portfolio, you know, and that's what we're doing, looking at our portfolio and looking at all our assets. And Birmingham's a massive landowner uh, on that. And what we don't want to do is just sell off all the crown jewels. We don't want to do that because that will be wrong. You know, there might be some circumstances that you do that. But what we want to do is look about the opportunity, about how can we, excuse the, the term, but how can we sweat them assets, assets? Can we go into partnership with them? Can we be our own developer? And by generating that capital, we then want to use that capital to, to do programmes, initiatives within them areas that Chris is talking about. That's the ambition, that, that's what we want to do. It's not a city centre inward focus, it's a city centre outward look, uh, focus, because the city centre will look after itself, it will, but we need to use them assets to actually create that opportunity and benefit and spread that growth to them areas that really, really need it. So that's the ambition. Now, in terms of the the buildings that you know, um, you know that uh, was mentioned, you know, I, I can't go into much detail about that because it's not in the the public uh, arena yet. But there are talks going on, you know, about how, how that them buildings can be repurposed, you know, and people like you know the Hammersons of this world and that, you know, they're all looking about, you know, how COVID as a agent for change has changed their way of thinking, you know, is there, is there any way that, you know, you provide a different offer within these facilities other than just shop, you know, could, you know, for example, could you put the home of metal into John Lewis, you know, so when you get off the, um, the train, you can get a bit of shopping, but also pop into an exhibition that's about Birmingham, Birmingham's musical heritage, you know, so we're looking at them sort of creative ways about how we repurpose these buildings. Great, thanks very much, Simon. Um, we've got another. Well, there's. Um, I just want to apologise to the to the um, poster who's um, posting in the chat as anonymous. I think you had some questions that were for um, Do um, Dr. Varney before he left on the on the COVID issue. So we'll pass those on. And then you put one in about. Um, I think it's about access accessibility. So, how will this environment in the city centre be accessible for particularly particularly with people with disabilities or um, um, other special needs? Yeah. Again, fantastic uh, question, you know, and it is really poignant as well. We we can't design our uh, cities that, that that don't cater for everybody. We will have failed, you know, and we are talking to um, uh, colleagues who with that expertise uh, who are very much part of our uh, working groups about how we de deliver that accessibility. We're also working with public health as well, you know, about the health and wellbeing agenda, you know, about how you bring them, um, you know, that, that green infrastructure, etc. So it's all part of our thinking going forward. And, you know, and it has to be because we can't ignore these things. We can't retro thing, retrofit these things after the event. So these are very much the top of our agenda going forward. That's reassuring to hear because I remember when the, the new um, bullring development was opened and, and there was a lot of feedback from wheelchair users about just the steepness of the of the, the slope going up, up, up you know, through the development. So um, I know you have things like panels with you know, with dis disabled you know, residents, um, but it's good, you know, as you say, to design for, for their needs so you don't need to retrofit. But I have to say I was quite surprised that the that Millennium Point, that's going to be a building that's only going to have had a two decade lifespan. But um, there you go. I suppose that's, you know, that... I mean, other buildings that you see in the future of the city, they're going to have, a, are they going to have a longer lifespan than that? Yeah, you, you know, it's, you know, Millennium Point did exactly what, what it needed to do. I mean, there's no, like I said, there's no fixed 
um, decision yet on anything I've showed you. You know, it's up for conversation. You know, people might turn around and say, oh, do not knock down Millennium Point. But we are t talking to the key stakeholders there, you know, and, you know, about the opportunity to repurpose it, you know, and how you connect then to the wider pieces, you know, by, by looking at Millennium Point, you know, by repositioning that and getting them links, you're then creating that opportunity for East Birmingham, you know, creating them, th them links to there and creating that job opportunity as well. You know, so it's, it's just, you know, taking these thoughts, thinking about them and kicking them around. But what's really key is that we deliver them. You know, if we do think it's a good idea, how do we then go and deliver them? And that's absolutely key because that's how I'll be measured, you know, on that, because there's no point having a document that just sits on the shelf that we can never, ever deliver. You know, so, you know, we, we've got to kick the can around a bit, Councillor, before we really make them decisions. Absolutely right. So, um, Councillor Grindrod, um, you're next. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. And thanks, Simon, for an excellent presentation. Really inspiring and uh, re really good images as well. Really, really kind of brighten up our screen this, this, this evening. Um, so my question is, obviously, in, in Bourneville and Cottridge, um, we've got a, a great legacy of, of, of some of the greatest achievements in this city in terms of the Cadbury uh, legacy to, to our community. And, and we've got a lot to learn from that as well. And I guess that leads me to the kind of conversation about how is it that we, we talked about the, you know, how the inner city areas can really benefit from the, the, from, from the plan. But how is it that we can get wider South Birmingham to, to benefit? We've got, you know, we've got a lot of uh, local businesses in, 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 our, in our community, but we've also got our, our kind of hub area of Cottridge. Uh, and, and, and I guess residents are spending a lot more time in their locality and they're keen to see how, the, you know, how this is, you know, our plans and our vision are going to extend uh, to the south of the city as well, and and I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts for us on how how we can be part of this as well in terms of the benefits for for, for our area and what what the legacies we're we're building for the future uh, in the way that the Cadbury's built their legacy. Yeah, you know, and, and we, you know, Councillor, we've got so much to learn from Cadbury's, haven't we? You know, not, you know that you know that you know the the perfect housing model, you know, the the perfect you know how they how they provision you know provided that public open space, etc. You know, and, and this what we're saying today is not rocket science. It's not. It's been done in the past, you know, and uh, Cabris and Bourneville, you know, what a fantastic example how you lay out a place, you know, how you provide that local centre, you know, how you provide that access to green public open space. You know, and when I was first doing this presentation before we started polishing it a bit more, you know, we were using Bourneville as an example about that best practice, you know, how, how you do that. And in terms of the question really is about you have got a say in in this document, you know, uh, you know, you've got that cultural legacy in Bourneville, you know, it has to come to the table and, and be highlighted about how we celebrate that. It can't be that inward looking approach as, a, as I'm trying to explain that we need to reach out. And I, and I really would, you know, ask you to say how you see the city centre playing and how it connects into where you live, you know, because we've got we, we won't stop that thinking. You know, we've got to think about where we then go from them in inner city areas. You know, already the combined authority have been saying to us as well, this is great. But then how do we start thinking about how do we expand further out? You know, where, where does that public transport stop and where does it end? You know, so th this journey will continue on, you know, and we can set that blueprint going forward, them ideas. So I really would appeal to you, you know, to the people that you represent to, you know, to actually, you know, say, look, Simon, this is how we see it. this is how it will benefit us uh, going forward you know this is an opportunity you know to really change how we do things in the future and and of course we know we've got the local center document which talk of, talks about the local centers and you're absolutely right you know it, you know how your local center is thriving it's really interesting how things come round now my challenge now is about you know how do I get the city center back to the place it was because local centers are outperforming the city center you know but how can we then support them local centers you know how can I spread that jam to you know Bourneville and Croft Cottage to actually you know reposition repurpose your local centers your schools your community facilities etc and, that, and that's what it's about that's what it's all about Great, thanks very much, Simon. I think your enthusiasm is you know, really, really infectious. And I think the, 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 the offer's there, isn't it, for everybody who's who's watching and, and dialing into this, you know, to, you know, to, to flood flood um, the, the council with your ideas, what you want out of the city centre, and how, how the city centre, you know, can benefit all of us out, out in the in the in the suburbs, you know, all around the city, and particularly the the the, the areas where we, with higher higher deprivation. So I. 
I can't see any other questions you know, from from um, participants at the moment. So I'd like to draw this part of the agenda to a close then. And, and thanks very much, Simon, um, for that, you know, that inspirational presentation. And uh, it's very good to, to hear a very serious fan of, of, of heavy metal here. So um, yes, we all should go and see that exhibition once we're, once we're all released and we have a chance to go. So um, thank you very much. And I think that actually makes, um, yes, thanks very much and, and uh, see, you, see you soon. Um, thank you very much. And what Simon said about you know, the importance of, you know, of um, jobs in um, the green economy for our young people, I think that you know, forms quite a nice bridge to the um, uh, presentation and the um, contribution now from Ilgun Yusuf, who's going to be talking to us about um, jobs and skills and the opportunities as we um, hopefully recover from the pandemic. So over to you, um, Ilgun. Thank you, Councillor. Can I just check? Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you um, loud and clear. Good, thank you. I was told to check for a five second uh, satellite delay. Great, thank you. Um, so um, my, I was also really inspired by what, what Simon said, um, both about the, the, the vision and his, uh, his, his uh, little history on, on the wonderful uh, cultural heritage of the city. I'm not a local, um, but I was a student here, so I do know the city um, from a certain time in my life. And all the things that Simon said, I, I, you know, I, I can totally testify to that. So um, in terms of what I do at the council, I, I've got two roles. I've got a substantive role in terms of the, I'm the head of service for Birmingham Adult Education, which is the largest education provider for adults in the country and um, has done a lot of fantastic work uh, across the council and with communities. And I'll say a little bit uh, during the course of my presentation about uh, about that work, um, but also particularly tonight, and I'm speaking to you in my capacity as the acting assistant director for skills and employability. Um, and what what I will say is that that enthusiasm that that, that uh, Simon would share, which I also found infectious, um, is a really good starting point because we we um, at the council have have as we emerge from the aftermath of the pandemic and indeed the, the restrictions and, and the current lockdown. I, I think there are fantastic opportunities for local people to benefit from those opportunities, both short and longer term. And in particular, uh, the work that um, myself and my team have been doing with Simon's team in, in the inclusive growth area, I think is testimony to that because what we really want to do is in terms of the lessons we want to take from, from this is actually the opportunity to make sure that when those opportunities and those careers become available uh, and we can see that they will and they are, that, that actually people have the skills. So on that note, during, during the lockdown, a little bit of a, a, a sort of a history lesson, and then I'm going to sort of talk about particular services and opportunities that, that are available now and, and will be in the foreseeable future. Uh, and then some practical suggestions about um, if people want to get in touch about particular courses, how they go about it, or skills opportunities. So I think, I think the first thing to say is during the lockdown, we were continuing to offer a number of services, obviously through virtual or online or remote means. And I think the, the first one I really want to highlight when we're talking about jobs and skills and opportunities and education is careers advice. That if people have the right information, advice and guidance, have the right career options available to them when they are deciding what they want and, and what that means in terms of a career. And I, I, I tell you why that really matters, because before the pandemic, OK, we found that some of the opportunities that people had, there wasn't always a self-evident career pathway progression route. And I think what we're going to do differently this time is actually work with employers. And these conversations have already started about making those jobs and those opportunities more attractive in terms of what career routes that they offer and making sure that people have those that training not just to secure that opportunity secure that job but also to flourish and feel supported that once they're in it they can actually people develop their career so i, I think it all starts off with good careers advice and um, people underscore uh, sorry pre-16 in terms of uh, school age 
um, will have, you know, advice to the best uh, careers uh, services available, either directly provided from schools or it can be provided um, from an external um, service. And indeed, Birmingham Council does have a career service which we, we do um, work in schools. But the Birmingham Career Service has a, has a public remit in terms of that 16 to 19. It has a website. Um, it's it's been delivering virtual or online or telephone service throughout the, since the first lockdown. And I'll put that link in, in the chat, if you like, um, when I when I finish my presentation. But I, I really can't stress that enough, is that people need to think about what, what skills do they have, what skills do they want to develop, but also what is it that they want from their career, okay? And actually, that may seem like a huge set of questions for people, but people much more skilled than me are really good at sitting down and providing one-to-one -one advice and, and really getting people to think about uh, what they want to do and maybe breaking it down into small steps about how people can get there. And I think that's really crucial, how they can get there, both in terms of the steps that people need to take, but also which particular college, independent training provider, adult education service can provide it, okay? Or which employer, for example. Um, so I, I think that's the first step. I think the other thing to say is that um, there's so so many opportunities out there that we our, our website um, is a really good place to go to. And again, I'll put that link um, in the chat. It, it's for all ages. So really, any anybody from 16 upwards, okay, um, to um, right, you know, six to somebody being in their 60s, 70s, or 80s. It's it's across the full age range. And I should say, it's not just about looking for jobs and careers there's also something in there about people who might be thinking around self-employment or um, they may even be thinking about a business um, and we don't always have to think about a super duper large business um, i know you know i said earlier that uh, i'm the head of service of Birmingham adult education there are lots of people who um are, are, carrying out various roles in their life and it actually suits them to go um, down a particular pathway of, of self-employment. That's not going to be um, what uh, everybody wants, but for some people that that's uh, an important part of what they want to uh, do with their career. Um, and I, th I think it's really important to know that. Um, so at the Library of Birmingham, we have uh, on level three, uh, but you can access it virtually as well. We do have a, a, a business and enterprise zone. For anybody who's interested in having a conversation, the services are entirely free. Uh, and we're, we're keen to, to make that available because I can tell you now, I mean, um, um, younger people, um, are getting more and more interested in enterprise, e-commerce, um, and sometimes um, it's not always clear the route to, 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 to go down in terms of getting advice on that. So th that would be something. We also have good connections with the Princess Trust, and obviously uh, that's for age group 18, 18 to, to 30. Uh, and I would, I would highly recommend that. Um, our youth employment service at the council um, we has a partnership with the Princess Trust um, both for enterprise and also for going for particular careers or working with employers and they have all the specialism you know as I said earlier careers having a skills audit um, getting people um, prepared for interviews and applying for for roles and most importantly is getting people in the work setting okay i think there are no, you know we know about uh, apprenticeships um apprenticeships the number of apprenticeships have slightly suffered because of the uh, lockdown as you might imagine but they are gaining ground again um, along with kickstart which is a wonderful opportunity again in the work setting for people um who who have been on universal credit um and you know that there's a really um, important uh, number of events that uh, are doing the rounds at the moment. Again, I can put that in the link, but that's something we are doing in partnership as a council 
um, with DWP, um, but we're also doing it in partnership with Greater Birmingham and Salihal LEP, uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, and, and the great thing about that is that um, it's, it's an opportunity for people um, for whatever reason, okay, uh, need need that support, need that the kind of skills you only really get in that work setting. And what you'll get is support in getting getting those roles in the into the work setting. And actually, once you're in in the work setting, having those fantastic skills. And there's nothing employers value more than um, not just um, working with somebody. Um, to help them achieve their careers, but actually supporting them to do so. So that person has a clear number of transferable skills, which may stay with that employer, or indeed you may use it to transfer it to another employer or indeed another industry. So it's, I, you know, I, I, I highly recommend that. Um, and um, we uh, also, I said earlier about working in terms of with LEP, we have a particular um, referral system in partnership with small and medium sized enterprises so we can act as a, as a broker or I'll go between if you like. Um, so lots and lots of services for young people. Um, we obviously have connections with colleges uh, and, uh, and other post-16 providers. Um, I, I, I think um, we will know about apprenticeships but there's also something called traineeships um, and for those people who are not familiar with traineeships, um, it's if it's it's a bit like a pre-apprenticeship. Um, so there's sometimes certain standards that are required, um, entry requirements that are required to do an apprenticeship. Um, they might be around levels of uh, English, might be levels of maths, or it might be about um, certain ways of. Um, how you certain behaviors associated in the work setting. So it's about how you, you know being able to work in a team, being able to manage yourself, being able to um, to to be punctual. OK, and those skills are increasingly valued by employers just as much as uh, academic or vocational skills. And and but, but they're not always readily available to people. And the great thing about a traineeship or some of the shorter work based programs is that it's a great opportunity to get that support um, to acquire those skills um, so that you can then be ready for an apprenticeship or ready for um, a particular career uh, depending on what it is you're looking for. And again, um, for people in terms of um, inclusiveness um, and for people with, with a disability and or learning difficulty, um, we, 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 we have at Birmingham Adult Education uh, a program, we have a, a pathway um, into work, we have um, those relationships with employers, um, we also work with colleges and the inclusion team at the council in terms of supported internships. Um, so I, you know, I think it's a, a really good opportunity um, to actually sort of say, come on, how can we um, work together? Um, we've got all, um, all those connections, either the council delivers it directly or we can signpost you the right into the right direction and have that conversation. And I, I, and I just want to say something about what uh, Simon was saying that um, we heard earlier that um, some of those fantastic construction projects, well, we have something at the council called the Employment Access Team. And that team has, has over the years, created um, more than 10,000 opportunities or jobs as a brokerage service. And a lot of local people benefited from that brokerage and actually um, got opportunities and went on to have fabulous careers and, and no doubt still are. Um, so that's a very important service. Um, in terms of where it is now, I would say that um, there are a number of growth areas, but you know some of the obvious ones are the Commonwealth Games, which is obviously around the corner. Um, and it's not 
um, ju just um, you know what would have been the, the hospitality sector or the retail sector. Perhaps we would have thought about that before the pandemic. Um, but there is also uh, a good chance to renew the tourism sector there. And uh, I, I think that's a really exciting opportunity. But of course, there's HS2. And when, whenever HS2 are recruiting, OK, they and like a lot of employers will come to our employment access team. OK, and uh, and it, again, it's on our website and again, I will put it in the link. So I think that's that's really important. I think the other thing I would say is that um, in terms of the adult education service, it may sound like it's people across the ages. We actually have hundreds of students who are with us who are in that 19 to 25 age group. OK, and I just want some, to sort of stress that um, because um, and, and what we're doing over the next 12 months or so, especially as hopefully um, we can all start meeting in the real world again in terms of face to face, is that we're actually in the spirit of what Simon was saying in terms of um, it's, you know, a whole city approach is that we are looking to find and picking up on the conversation that was had at the end of Simon's presentation is that we're looking to work in a more local way. So um, what, what do I mean by that is that um, there's quite a strong infrastructure in the north of the city and in the east of the city around bringing employment and skills together. And we think that's the key, really, um, because it's really important people are getting those skills, but it's really important even more important that there are those opportunities where those skills um, can lead to, to jobs and careers. Um, so I'd be really um, maybe as a bit of a takeaway and that, you know, um, put it out there. If we could look to do a bit more work in the south and this part of the city um, to to create that kind of infrastructure um, or, or build on where there is already that network. Um, and I think that that's quite key. Um, so, 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 what we what we we do there is actually um, in the north and in the east. You've got a skills in. Sorry, Yusuf, I'm, I'm just a bit aware of, aware of time. So, can I ask you to draw to a close? Sorry, no, no, sorry, I do appreciate that. Okay, so I think I think the last thing I would just say is that. Um, as I say, I put it in the in the in the link that we we have got training opportunities right across the board. OK, in terms of the age groups. Um, if you go to our website, OK, you can see all those connections there and there's help with what kind of career do you want? Um, what kind of courses do I need and where are the vacancies? And I think that's Th th those are the key links and uh, very keen to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sorry to, um, to have interrupted there and, and also sorry for getting your name wrong, <laughs> Ilgan. So, so, um, but I thought that was a very good, you know, um, very good summary and you know, a re reassuring message that, that help and support and advice is there because it's a very you know, worrying time now, isn't it, that we, when we're facing um, what's going to be coming up, um, up in terms of, of the um, moving out of the pandemic and possibly the end of, of schemes like furlough and the, the prospects for young people and you're making the transition out of education in, into work. So it's it's a, a reassuring message. And if you're able to post the links in the in the Q at the um, Q&A, I think that would be very helpful. Um, and certainly the, you know, the, the, the challenge to us to, to sort of um, start making the connections with you and, and look at um, improving the, the, the communications in the south of the city. I think, yeah, that's um, um, very important as well. And make, make putting people in touch with the employers who are actually offering offering um, career prospects very, very important. Um, I'm just looking in the event q and I'm just can't see any questions at the moment. So um, is there anything sort of con concluding um, remarks you'd like to make? OK, um, so I, I, I think I, I think I think the, the, the key thing is, is that um, we um, that we've, we've in we've how can I put it? We, we are we have lots of funding in the council, which is probably a good thing to say for skills and training. OK, and I, I think the important thing move moving ahead is that we absolutely um, sit down and, and, and work with you because um, to, I just want to pick up on that last point is that um, we've heard a lot around uh, East Birmingham model and I'd like to work with the local community and with local employers 
um, at, at, including Simon, of course, in, in terms of the inclusive growth team, and see what we can do to actually put together a particular strategy. Um, at the moment, we're working on a skills jobs convergence strategy, um, and we will be um, launching um, a task force um, later this spring. But the important thing is, is that we want to have a local approach. So um, I would welcome any comments, any ideas of how we can support and take that forward. Thank you. OK, there was a question, sorry, that's just come up, which is about yeah. developing um, great opportunities for, for jobs in green industries, which I think was um, covered um, in, in some point, uh, in some part uh, through Simon's presentation. But um, do you have any views on that? Absolutely. So um, um, st strategically, one of the things that we are doing is that we are working with the colleges um, in partnership with the combined authority to make sure that there are those um, pathways to those higher level skills jobs, because um, a, a lot of those green jobs and a lot of those environmental jobs um, are, are, are going to be of a higher skill set um, in terms of level three, A level or equivalent, if you like. Um, so I think that the key thing there is is to, um, to to create those pathways. So, for example, adult education, um, we've got a partnership with South and City College. So if anybody came to us, we could provide those courses. I think in the short term, in terms of Kickstart, um, the future parks accelerator project, um, we heard a lot about parks parks and Simon's presentation, um, we will be prioritising some of the kickstart placements that we have in the council for just that very area. So um, I, I, it's it's very much a skill set that's needed and we are actively promoting it. Great, thank you very much Ilgan. That's a very, very, um, um, again, hopeful and I think inspiring message from you about um, the, the prospects of the future as we, as we emerge hopefully from the from this, this awful period of the pandemic. So thank you very much for joining us this evening and yes we'll, we'll um, move on now to the, to the rest of the agenda but, uh, but great to see you. Um, you. So the, the, the next item um, which was really just to, to let uh, everyone who's watching know that the City Council has made a, a fund available for, for um, community organisations to get engaged in the um, the, the Commonwealth Games um, and the run up to Commonwealth Games and during the Commonwealth Games. And in our um, Bourneville and Cottage Ward, we will be getting a sum of £28,600, um, which will be um, available for applications for, for grants, you know, for grants of, of amounts um, ranging from £100 up to um, £10,000. £10, and the idea is that, that, that they could be on um, three major themes. One is um, sport and physical activity. The second one is um, sprucing up our community and get, getting games ready, um, looking at how we how we um, increase civic pride in, in, in our area. And the third theme is um, celebrating culture, looking at the, the um, our links with the Commonwealth and, and also researching the, 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 the history of our of our of our neighbourhood. So I think that's an, an exciting opportunity and it's it's good to be able to come to a meeting and and and, and let you know that there is some some um, funding available to do to good to do good things in our communities because all too often um, over the past years we've been talking about a, an environment um, dominated by cuts. So the the information um, about this grant funding scheme is on the um, the council's website. If you just search for um, Birmingham City Council celebrating communities, and I'll, I'll put it I'll put it into the Q and A as well um, once I've um, once I have a chance. So that that is really just to flag up that that um, grant funding, which has been um, the scheme has been live since the first of March. Um, and if you go onto the website and search for celebrating communities, you'll see what the the application process is. But but we will be you know, keen to go out and and talk to um, Groups and community groups and sports groups in in Bournemouth and Cottage about about your ideas and and we will work with you to develop um, applications. Um, the intention is that that applications will come back via the ward forum so that so that the um, participants in the forum can can get get, get an idea o o on the projects that are being proposed and and vote on them as well. So that's just to sort of fill you in on the um, celebrating um, communities um, grant funding and as part of the preparation for the Commonwealth Games. Um, Fred, Councillor Grindelwald, do you want to um, talk about any local issues? 
Um, I don't think we've got that much time, Liz. So um, I'll just be very, very brief to say that um, we I'm starting up my ward walks again, which is where myself and the local highways engineer uh, do a walk, walk a couple of streets in our area to inspect the pavements, the roads and any other issues uh, that uh, need fixing. So if anybody um, who's listening would like us to do walk, do the walk on their road or their street, then do get in contact with me uh, directly, either via email or on social media. Um, the other thing is obviously the the Bonville um, the, the Valley Parkway boating pool uh, is reaching the conclusion of its uh, repairs, and um, and and I do encourage residents to go and see the great job that has been done by uh, the council's team with uh, working with the um, the Bonville Model Boating Club there for that for for that um, the improvements that have gone on there. And I guess the the other thing, Liz, is that next board forum um, I, we're going to have to have another one quite relatively soon because uh, people have been contacting us asking us to. To, to make sure we can talk about issues around exempt accommodation and, and houses of multiple occupancy, particularly in in the in, in the top part of our ward. So that would be something worth um, worth uh, bearing in mind uh, for the future. The other thing, just on the back of um, Ilgan's uh, excellent presentation there as well, is whether we should consider doing some kind of jo skills show jobs fair activity in 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 Bournemouth and Cottage Ward and maybe looking to to, to 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 link in with some of the local secondary schools uh because I, I do think it's about how we bring uh, the work that we're, we're doing as a council locally into communities uh would be a really good re really good thing to do so that's the a very brief update from me Liz um because I'm aware of time Great, thanks, Fred. And I think the idea of a local jobs fair is an, is, a, is an excellent one and we're actually at a phase where you know, we've had the recent announcement from um Cadbury's that they're bringing um, new production back into 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 Birmingham as well so it would be an opportune time for that um, and then the, just the final thing from me then is um, to remind people that the council is also um, carrying out a um, consultation on the second phase of the places for people um, initiative in in our area um, looking at active travel and pr promoting um, walking and cycling and there's a um, a website on the com on the commonplace platform for you to feed in your ideas about how you'd like to see um, streets um, in Bournemouth and Cottage become more friendly places for for, for um, walking and cycling and active travel. So uh, please you know, do um, give us your ideas about how how you'd like to see your streets um, um, change and become a, a more friendly environment for, walk for walking and cycling. Okay, well I can see that we're just just um, over our um, allotted time now, so. I'm going to thank all the speakers who joined us this, this evening. I think we've had a really, really interesting um, range of um, perspectives and you know, an update on the, the COVID situation and then that, you know, that vision of the city centre and that message about the, the, the support and advice that's available there for, for people seeking um, new jobs and skills. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next World Forum um, in, uh, in a few months time. Thank you very much. <laughs>